Okay, this week we're going to talk about the medical evaluation of psychosis. Essentially, what are the lab tests or examination procedures that should be done uh, for somebody who has a condition that looks like schizophrenia? The, the need for complete medical evaluation prior to assigning the diagnosis of schizophrenia is actually very explicitly stated in the DSM. Uh, verbatim from DSM-5, you cannot call it schizophrenia, I'm paraphrasing now, you can't call it schizophrenia until it's not something else. In other words, um, you have to actively rule out physiological effects of drug abuse, medications, or other medical conditions, um, schizophrenia as a diagnosis of exclusion. And because it's a disease that carries a hefty price tag as well as a great deal of stigma, uh, we really need to be um, proactive in ruling out these different uh, potential causes of schizophrenia-like symptoms. So specifically, why do we want to do a complete medical evaluation first? We want to look if for a treatable cause of something that can explain the symptoms. Uh, this relates to patients having an absolute right to get an accurate diagnosis. Um, it should make us feel some pressure as clinicians to, uh, to do that as well. It's kind of our moral duty. Uh, we because we want to alle uh, alleviate unnecessary suffering and if you are treating something as schizophrenia which turns out for example to have been celiac disease um, then you're spending in 2000 in year 2000 dollars about twenty six thousand dollars per year for the wrong care um, which comes with its own risks of side effects and uh, also you're missing the treatable condition um, and in fact I'm you know celiac disease actually does present with psychosis in some in some circumstances uh, that can persist for several years before it declares itself through gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, we also want to make sure that we discover non-treatable causes of psychosis. And this is where some people get a little bit worked up. Why should we go looking for diseases that we can't treat? And the simple answer is because you want to avoid unnecessary treatments and stigma. So uh, from, from, from my medical school days, we had a lady who was 26 years old and she looked for all the world as if she had schizophrenia, save for the fact that she had this ravenous appetite um, and would literally um, eventually steal candy bars out of your coat pocket. Uh, I, I'm not making that up, that actually happened. Uh, and then, you know, to the credit of the doctors at the time, they did a brain scan and she had some atrophy of her frontal lobe and that, worked, that resulted in a biopsy, which resulted in a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia, a variant of Pick's disease. So although we couldn't treat it, I feel bad for the patient and her family to this day that she had a neurodegenerative disease that was untreatable. We could at least stop telling everybody to label her as schizophrenia, um, we could suggest that a screw home for people with schizophrenia was probably not the right diagnosis, and labeling her with the appropriate diagnosis of a neurodegenerative neurological disorder actually opened up avenues of care which were closed when she was simply a person with schizophrenia, yet another girl with schizophrenia, in other words. So um, even though you can't uh, treat some cases, you can at least avoid unnecessary treatments and stigma. We also want to do a complete evaluation at the day number one because uh, people with schizophrenia have, even aside from treatment, they have higher risks of insulin resistant diabetes and movement disorders. So we want to capture the snapshot of where they are before we initiate treatment. And also many of our patients will have poor access to other kinds of uh, psychiatric, to medical care. So in doing a complete medical evaluation, we can screen for um, undetected uh, medical illnesses, which even though they might not be related to the symptoms of psychi the psychiatric symptoms, nonetheless would be important to recognize. Uh, those who say that we shouldn't spend uh, thousands upon thousands of dollars doing um, blood tests for esoteric diseases, and many people actually argue against routine brain imaging. I'm going to argue back against them shortly. But uh, people say we shouldn't do all these things because essentially the yield is low. So if we screen a thousand people for celiac disease, we might only find, well, the data actually says you would find 50 cases. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they would say it's a low number and we shouldn't do it unless it's clinically indicated because taking a population economy argument, uh, if we spend all the money doing tests with low yield, then there won't be money left over for tests uh, for other conditions. Um, I'm going to now talk back against that. In, in other words, so I'm going to call this argument, we should do the bare minimum workup. And the argument against this is that here's, this is a partial, underlining partial list of diseases that can present with symptoms that are identical to those of schizophrenia. Um, 
it's a kind of big list. And here um, are some, to the extent that anybody, any professional organizations in the world actually have clinical guidelines for laboratory testing, um, there aren't that many, but here are the major ones. On the far right, United States American Psychiatric Association, um, to the APA's credit, comes out with the most comprehensive list of recommendations, but it's still relatively sparse. Basically, CBC, electrolytes, kidney function, liver function, thyroid, top screen, and syphilis. Those are the ones that they would say you should do routinely. Um, and if you follow the APA's extensive list of recommended laboratory tests, this is the number of diseases you will detect from that table, the ones in yellow. Um, so there's a lot left that uh, you won't detect unless you go looking for things. And so again, um, you don't want to miss vitamin, vitamin D deficiency or celiac disease or a brain tumor. Uh, those things can be easily screened and, and I would say that we should do it. Um, to try to convince you further that medical work of investment on day number one is worthwhile, I wanna try to impress you with some findings about what is the frequency with which we find um, relevant, by, by relevant I mean medical diseases which create the symptoms that resemble schizophrenia. And the answer is between five and 12% of cases. Uh, so in one study of um, consecutive psychiatric patients, 12% of individuals had um, a medical condition which was relevant to the psychiatric presentation. And sadly, according to the authors Johnson et al. in 68, 80%, that's eight zero percent of those medical uh, diagnoses were missed um, prior to the admission to the psychiatry board. Uh, in looking at uh, nothing but first episode schizophrenia patients, we found about 6% um, of them had a medically explanatory, um, otherwise would have been occult medical disease causing their symptoms. And so various, you know, very, very estimates. It, it, it's, it's, um, not an insignificantly small number. And if you are the family member of one of those 5% that has sister psychosis, sister sarcosis, or sarcoidosis, or syphilis that was missed, you would be a little irate. Um, so what exactly do, what should we be doing when we, when we find our patients with a new onset of, of schizophrenia, or by the way, in people that have an established diagnosis of schizophrenia but aren't, ex aren't responding as expected to schizophrenia-focused treatments? Uh, well, we should do physical exam, including pounding the table here, neurological exam. Uh, we should also, um, these days it's done commonly, but we should make sure we do height, weight, and waist circumference to establish a metabolic baseline. For laboratory tests, nothing surprising here. This is, this, this, these tests are pretty much in line with the APA recommendations, although they don't specifically list calcium and phosphorus. Uh, and APA actually says electrolytes, and so many people interpret that to be sodium, potassium, uh, uh, and I'm liking it, like chloride and bicarbonate. And bicarbonate. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, not, anyway, calcium is, not, is oftentimes not included as a standard electrolyte, and so if you, if you don't do that, you would have missed um, hyperparathyroidism and hypoparathyroidism, um, which can occur with some frequency. Uh, so beyond what the APA recommends, these are uh, tests which look for inflammatory diseases or autoimmune diseases. So one can start with very general screens of, um, of, inflamm of inflammation, C-reactive protein, and erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Uh, going down, a ferritin is actually um, typically associated with iron, iron status, but it's also an inflammatory marker. Um, and then more specifically, we can look for uh, screens for specific, auto, specific and relatively common autoimmune diseases like lupus, um, Hashimoto's, and, um, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and NMDA receptor encephalitis. Looking at globulin to albumin levels gives you an uh, indication as to whether we are a patient may be overproducing um, antibodies uh, for, against um, antigens. Uh, this would be a list of, of tests to look for evidence of, of um, infections or for deficiencies. Um, syphilis, ironically, um, psychiatrists were thrilled to have discovered that back in the day it was called, um, well, it was called paralytic insanity or various other sorts of things. Um, it had a variety of names. These days we call it tertiary syphilis. Uh, but it was, it was, it, 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 back in the day, it was, it was discovered that 10% of the asylum patients um, had tertiary syphilis, uh, which led to 
psychiatric changes led to them being in, hospitalized. So following the discovery, everybody was tested for syphilis for decades. And in recent, in recent years, that's falling off. And I'm hearing um, more and more cases of syphilis being detected after five years or longer of continuous illness. Um, so it's, it's out there. It's actually making a comeback. So um, it's a very cheap test and don't forget it. Um, HIV is also out there and the, you know, I, I would argue for making it a routine screen. We have treatments now that can, um, that, that can put it into very long remission. Um, and it's, I think it's worthwhile to do even for somebody that might have a so-called high risk lifestyle, ditto, ditto for hepatitis. Uh, these other tests are, um, again, truly they're going to be low, low yield. You're not going to find more than, than a single digit percentage of people who are deficient in these, in these substances or have heavy metal screens, but um, they're relatively cheap as a one-time investment and they will lead to actionable results. And your analysis, uh, your analysis, yeah, uh, to be, to, to do. Uh, imaging, uh, I, I will also put on the table, X, chest x-rays are cheap, and in the one of those cohorts I described showing about 5% incidence of medical diseases, um, those medical diseases which cause psychiatric symptoms were picked up on chest x-ray, uh, sarcoid and bronchial tumor specifically. Uh, brain imaging, I'm going to say, should be done. An MRI should be preferred, and this should be a routine test. The APA says um, do it if indicated, but the APA doesn't actually say what specifically is the indication. Uh, most clinicians will think that the indication for MRI is a quote-unquote neurological symptom, meaning specifically a deficit in speech or coordination or strength or, uh, or, or, or motion, something that's visibly obvious. Uh, but I'd like to point out that the most common lesions which lead to, sch to schizophrenia-like symptoms occur in frontal cortex, temporal cortex, limbic structures, um, or, the, or the internal midline structures, uh, like the cingulate gyrus. You can have a complete obliteration um, of, of large portions of real estate in each of these brain regions and have no neurologic symptoms in the classical sense. They won't affect your speech, your memory, your coordination, your uh, strength. Um, they are so they are neurologically silent. In other words, uh, the primary symptom of a meningioma impinging upon the temporal lobe is going to be hallucinations. That's it. Uh, so essentially, I'm saying that psychosis is de facto a primary neurological symptom. And if you want to say that safe MRI for neurological symptoms, the fact that somebody's hallucinating is is that. Um, and if you do comprehensive workup at the beginning, you'll find between five and 10% of people will have an actionable and relevant medical disease that's causing the symptoms or contributing to them. Uh, so we should um, not overlook it and we should do it in every, every new case. And as I said, in every case in which there is treatment resistance um, and the, 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 the stakes go even higher if there is an atypical presentation. For example, the young woman that had the frontotemporal dementia, she had this ungodly attraction to sweets. Um, that was an atypical presentation of schizophrenia and actually turned out to be relevant because she was, she was demonstrating something on the spectrum of a human, of a human Kluber Busey sy sy uh, syndrome. Um, or anytime there's been a significant change in the clinical picture, it should cause a clinician to uh, re-up his or her suspicion of a, uh, an occult medical disease. So those are the comments I have on medical workup.